one of the big things to note about white pine, and we all know this, is that, you know, they say it's the, the tree that won the Revolutionary War because, you know, it's so important for ships, masts, and, and planks and things. And when the British Empire couldn't get a hold of any more white pine from, uh, from the northern uh, North American continent, they, that really hurt their war efforts. And so essentially, uh, white pine has this really great reputation from back in the day of being high volume, lightweight, straight grain wood that was really well used. And so something to think about is we sort of hear those stories and we think, oh, white pine was, you know, filling, you know, all the East Coast and these, you know, climax forests. And ironically, white pine, while it was widespread, uh, it was actually a pretty small component of the eastern, of the pre-European settlement, uh, eastern forest, uh, compared to beech, sugar maple, hemlock, and oak, which accounted for about 79% of the total trees that were marked in these uh, original land surveys. Essentially, uh, what's happening there is as you move forward through the continent, you're going to be moving on waterways, and you're going to be seeing the pine trees along these waterways, and people are either one thinking, oh, this forest of pine trees goes on forever because they're just moving down along the waterway. And another thing that happened is uh, they sort of inflated the estimates to attract people to settle in, in a place saying, oh, this is great, you know, all these pine trees. Um, and the other thing is that the accessibility along the river systems where they're occurring allowed them to be, you know, easily dropped into the river and floated to a mill or rafted onto a larger um, river and, and move down to a mill on a, in another location. And we have some record of that happening locally as well. Um, so the early logging was concentrated on the river systems and a lot of time it was, you know, you just, you show up in a place to settle and you cut the pine trees down. They're really easily accessible and that's what you build your cabin out of. And then as soon as somebody fills, you know, starts the sawmill, those are the first logs that they send to the, to the market. So that was kind of uh, what happened all throughout the Eastern United States with these pine trees. And the takeaways from the study, I would encourage people to go and look at that whole paper because it's really great. But the takeaways are that pines were widely distributed in the Eastern forest. Uh, they occurred on a large range of topographic and moisture conditions. So, you know, they're found in acidic wetlands, uh, but also high and dry places. Uh, but mainly they occurred in large numbers on sandy to sandy loam soils um, along the river systems. And they, you know, if you're looking at uh, a, a big area, they're rarely a first rank dominant species as far as number of trees. Um, but they probably occurred in nearly pure stands in a lot of specialized areas such as river valleys and streamside slopes, ridge tops, um, places of glacial outwash with the uh, sandy material. And uh, so you think about that as sort of like their distribution being bimodal with peaks in the riparian valleys and then um, and other places where you have um, nutrient poor areas, places that are dry, they uh, experience frequent blowdown, which is something that uh, helps, you know, big pine trees get blown over and little pine trees grow up in the, in the place that, where they're knocked down. And uh, they're probably in places that were uh, more mesic and rich sites, sugar maple and beech would outcompete the pines. Um, and they also competed with hemlocks on um, sort of north uh, facing cool slopes. Uh, but the other uh, determination is that white pine may have reached its greatest distribution on the coarse textual glacial Iowa soils in the Great Lakes states, um, which were drier and frequently, more frequently burned than counterparts in New England, and that's where we have our trees today. Um, I have tons and tons of historical documentation, uh, documentation for our area, and I sort of wouldn't winnowed that down to uh, not giving every example in this presentation for sake of time. But uh, this is a really good one. This is from uh, Charles Deem. This is right at 100 years ago, published in 1921 from the Trees of Indiana. And uh, Deem's record here, uh, I'll go ahead and just uh, read it. I know that's not something you really do, but uh, he says, the next appearance of this species is to the south in Warren County on the outcrops of sandstone along Big Pine, Little Pine, Rock, and Kickapoo Creeks. It's found more or less on the bluffs of these creeks. It was most abundant along the Big Pine Creek and followed up the creek for a distance of about 10 miles, or midway between Rainsville and Indian Village, which I believe is Pine Village. Uh, to the south, it's next found in Fountain County on the outcrops of sandstone along the Big Shawnee and Bear Creeks. Bear Creek is the um, Portland Arch Creek. Uh, it says Franklin Lots, who owns the Bear Creek Canyon, which is Portland Arch. Uh, just south of Fountain says he remembers the area before any cutting was done on the creek. 
He says that the white pine was a common tree along the creek for a distance of half a mile, and a few scattered trees were found as far as 40 rods from the creek, which is about 660 feet. Um, he stated that the largest trees were about 30 inches in diameter and as high as the highest of the surrounding trees. So right in Trees of Indiana there, Dean gives us nice, concise, you know, along these tributary streams to the Wabash and the Wabash um, is, is where these trees are found. Another really interesting historical documentation I wanted to include here because it has a lot to do with what I mentioned about the sawmills uh, is a record that I found from these, these guys, Elmore Bars and uh, J.W. Wicker. Uh, these guys were uh, older guys in the early 1920s. They'd been around Attica their whole life, local historians. And they had this tour that they gave and this was published in the Indiana Magazine of History. And they mentioned that there was a sawmill one mile east of the northeast corner of the present corporation of the city of Attica. It says it sawed nothing but pine timber. And he goes on to give the details that the saw was an up and down saw, a muley, and sawed nothing but pine timber. Some of the logs saw in which were sawed into lumber here were brought from north of Independence, uh, or the Black Rock Barrens area. Uh, this sawmill was run by a name named William Brown. And then it goes on to say that the mill started in 1829 or 30, and it ran until 1845. Now, uh, at that point, Dan Yunt and John Yunt, uh, a couple of brothers, took over the mill site and the dam. And I found a lot of documentation of those owners of that mill um, later, about 50, later, 50 years later in the late 1800s uh, in Attica. Those guys still own the mill, and they, they still um, were bringing water into the town to run these other things, the distillery and the tanning yard and more sawmills and a grist mill and woolen mills. So, uh, you know, 15 years of sawing nothing but pine timber from north of Independence is something that got my attention and uh, sort of some of the details. So this is kind of an anecdotal um, example, and I couldn't find any uh, records from the sawmill, but um, still, you know, very interesting. So uh, with that sort of background, let's go ahead and go into uh, what are we looking at here as far as where do we have the trees and where's the suitable habitat? This is a map showing uh, sort of our area, Fountain County, Warren County, and Tippecanoe County. Uh, and this is a soils map from soilexplorer.net, developed by uh, Daryl Schultz at Purdue. And this shows us uh, our parent materials. What are the soils made out of in these areas? And uh, a lot of what you see on here, the sort of grayish brown color, uh, is glacial till. And all of the green areas are glacial outwash. So you can see the Weah Plains there, um, just and this area right here is all glacial outwash. And then you'll see these sort of tan areas. Um, these tan areas are residuum from acid clastic rocks. This is sandstone and siltstone exposures in the soil that forms them. And you'll see that they're concentrated along these tributary streams in Warren County. Uh, this is the Big Pine Creek here. This is the Little Pine Creek here, the Black Rock Barrens area here. This is um, in Fountain County in areas where I'm not really familiar with this um, area at this point, but down here is going to be Portland Arch, Bear Creek Canyon, Shawnee Bottoms, and Big Shawnee Creek. Um, and sort of this way in Warren County, you you can't even really see the tan too much because there's just not that much of it. It's concentrated right along the streams, but Rock Creek, um, Kickapoo Creek here, and uh, Redwood Creek, um, those are all ones that are mentioned as having existing pine trees. So let's kind of dive in and get a closer look at the Black Rock Barrens and Little Pine Creek area. This is, um, when I started at Niches, we protected one native pine tree and that pine tree was at the Wiley Leopold property and um, sort of had me thinking about pine trees, but one tree wasn't really, you know, of that much interest. And then we expanded uh, the Black Rock Barrens to in include this area here um, that was owned by Nancy Grenard, known as the Birdfoot Barrens. And this area has, records of some really cool species and it has a big pine tree on it. And all of a sudden now we've got a clump of pine trees here. And then um, I discovered that there's pine trees over here. And all the while I'm discovering all these pine trees in uh, the Little Pine Valley. And so um, you can really see this big concentration of these residuum soils along the stream valley and out in the Black Rock Barrens area um, where we have uh, control over a large portion of these ownership and we're working with the neighbors in here too uh, to sort of manage that whole area as one um, sort of 
natural space, which is what it is. Um, so let's go ahead and take a quick look at the Little Pine Creek. Uh, Niches only owns one property out here, but we have done some work on on several properties in the valley, um, and uh, there are records, um, previous records of these white pines that are documented in uh, the DNR office, something that I noticed there and then went and found out what was going on with these trees. And so um, looking in here, let's go to look at this record from John Collette. Uh, John Collette was the field person who did the Warren County Geological Survey, he did that in 1873. This was a big uh, thing for me to stumble across and find a lot of records of pines and, and what he was looking at there. Our earliest records are from the land survey records in the 1820s, and I will uh, show a few of those records as we move along. Uh, this is one just to sort of move down um, the Little Pine Creek and look at the occurrences that are recorded there. Um, we see this falling rock cascade. Um, it's, uh, they actually, he actually marks it in section six, but in reality, it's section five. Uh, Colette does make a couple mistakes here and there, but you can sort of calibrate this out because it says on the land belonging to Orrin Munson, this is an old plat book and it says O Munson here. Uh, and he talks about um, exposed top of conglomerate. Um, there's a falls and here is the falls marked on the map as well. Um, and he mentions that the pine trees around the rim make perpetual shade in this cool grotto, a favorite resort for the basket meetings of the United Brethren Church. Um, and you can also see over here, here's a steam sawmill that's just right there, right down the road. Um, and a uh, good sandstone here, and it seemed to me that maybe that's been quarried out as well because I don't see that um, in, in, in real life when I go there. But here's a picture of that grotto. Uh, this is a really fantastic area. This is owned by a guy named Herb Grum now, and um, he has a couple of uh, renters that live on the property with him. And uh, it's got major issues with invasives and things, but this grotto and another grotto on the property are really fantastic botanical areas. There's actually no um, white pine trees on the top of this bluff right now, uh, but all the description that he gives in here, he says, uh, precipitous overhanging sides are fringed with long pendant masses of stalactic or mossy tufa. Uh, and you can see that here in the picture. There's clumps of tufa on here, and it looks like maybe some was quarried out of this area as well. Uh, they burn that and use it for lime. Uh, this is a really cool spot. And so this is that area right here. Uh, the waterfall is somewhere right around here, and there's a really another cool um, drainage and sort of small waterfalls through here. And then as you go down the Little Pine Creek, uh, you, we come to Louise Jewell's property or Highbridge country as some people know, know it. Um, this area along both sides of the creek, there's about 20 uh, native white pines. There is one spot where there's a clump of them together and a couple of large trees and then the others are just sort of scattered around uh, one or two uh, at, a, at a position. And uh, this property also includes um, our large yellow lady slippers, which we've used that in a in a cross-pollination program here for a few years with the, our other population in the lower valley and now also with individuals at Portland Arch. And we also have done uh, niches, took on invasive removal on this 13 acre section of Louise's property uh, through an equip program where the funding was returned to us uh, and we went and completed that work there. And so in the meantime, even though we don't own this property, um, we did do a uh, great service to the pine trees and the other rare plants on the property by getting in there and removing those invasive species. And that's something that's been happening at all these local properties uh, through this area. So um, here is the largest pine trees on Louise's property. You can see that they're on a, a siltstone bluff. I would estimate that that's about 35 or 40 feet uh, tall rock wall. And on top of it, you can see a couple of large pines and there's a clump of uh, maybe 15 total trees right there. Some are very small, some are intermediate sized. Um, and along this whole section of the creek, there's about 20 of them. This is a picture from uh, another private landowner just down the way. Um, this is a, a side ravine above Little Pine Creek. And there's one really large remnant tree there. And there actually is a little bit of regeneration there too. Um, mostly it's just these two little uh, trees that have uh, germinated in the grasses just outside of the woodland edge. And you can see in there are 
big tooth aspen that's one of our companion trees for where we find the pine trees locally uh, and then so let's look at an original land survey record from our area so um, I started to get interested in these pines and I was like well I want to see these original land survey records so I went to the Warren County Courthouse in September of 2015 and uh, I was able to poke around in there and find um, photocopied versions of the original uh, land surveys, the actual original ones that are burned in a fire, but they got copies from the Indianapolis office or something that had them available. So I was able to look through and I just kind of looked at all of our properties that had sandstone exposures and just looking for, you know, do, do they mention any pines in these surveys from 1820? And this one's actually from 1822. And I found one. It says land broken in third rate, timber oak hickory with a few, a few white pines on the banks of the brooks of freestone rocks. Um, and they also mark a white pine as a witness tree. So, um, you know, you have to train your cursive writing um, deciphering here, but uh, the very top line says north between section seven and eight. And if you look at the third line, it says six chains, that's their marking for these um, section lines. And then uh, it says white pine, 12 inch diameter. At first I'm like, well, is what is that? <laughs> and uh, it's, over here, you can sort of cross-reference and see that that is a W, um, southwest and northwest over here, which is um, teach your kids cursive. Um, so that section is right here between section seven and eight, and you can see um, the topography there is obviously got you know some rugged topography, changes in elevation, almost uh, undoubtedly sandstone canyons through this area. Um, that is just west of our Conkey's Little Pine uh, property. And uh, you can see down here, this is the Black Rock Barrens and Wyler Leopold. These are the other properties that I was pointing out, Louise Jewell's property um, and Johnny Clemmie's property here with the other pine tree. And so this is the other thing that we have from Conkey's. We don't have an actual record of a pine tree from there, but we have these local ones. And then um, Conkey's Little Pine is actually partially owned by Alton Lindsay. And Alton Lindsay wrote a book called Natural Sun Watch in 1983. And in that book, he gives some details of the property where he talks about the yellow lady slippers there. He also talks about bird's foot violets and a few other interesting things. Um, but he, uh, he gives this great description um, that was told to him by one of the other people there that was, they, he mentions that they still signed with an ex. Uh, they were from Pioneer stock and he says in, in 1891 the hard scrabble farmer there had cut down many white pines in the northwest cove he sank the logs across the 30-foot creek squared them with his broad axe and built a two-story four-room house on the high terrace and here is a picture of that grotto in the northwest corner there's no doubt that that's exactly what he's talking about and here's another sort of um circumstantial uh, evidence of pines uh, along with the companion plants that we generally see with them, partridge berry, uh, maple leaf viburnum, uh, some of the big ones that are really prevalent at this conky site. Here's another one, uh, Monotropa hypopotis. It's uh, a species known as pine sap, and uh, I've never seen this species anywhere else before on us. Uh, and I did photograph it there in July of 2015 above the grotto. And uh, it's just known and named for growing under white pine. So I thought that was of interest. So uh, looking at this area again and zooming in to the Black Rock Barrens area, we're gonna look at this section right here. This is where we have a single white pine on this ridge, our original white pine that niches protected. And then here's our expanded area in the Bird's Foot Barrens where we added to the property from Nancy Grenard. We're gonna look at this privately owned ridge right here with white pine on uh, Wally Morrison and Catherine Scott Moncrief's property. And then we're gonna look at Black Rock and Pottawatomie Trail and this other part of the Barrens here where I'm interested in expanding uh, the, the pine population to restore to this whole sort of Black Rock Barrens area. At Wyler Leopold, as I mentioned, uh, there's just a single tree there. Uh, it's on the Siltstone Barrens slope. All of our pine trees had a mast year in 2017. Uh, I only see them kind of sporad sporadically make cones other years. In 2017, every single pine tree, not just the naturally occurring ones, but every pine tree around had a big year for seed production, whatever that environmental cue was. Um, and we had our uh, prescribed fire plan for this area in 2018. So 
uh, we were really careful about, you know, what does that mean? You know, if you have a mass deer for these things and they drop seed everywhere, if you have a prescribed fire after that, are you going to destroy the seed? Um, are you going to see great germination from that? Um, you know, what are you going to see? And so before we did our burn there uh, in 2018, I did a little bit of prep on the site. I went and cleared around the tree and uh, I left a little spot of leaf litter underneath and a leaf blown strip and then we had our burn um, and you can see the little break worked. It stopped the fire from going to right up to the base of the tree um, and this is sort of a test. Okay we have a single tree here. We know it had a lot of cones on it and it was going to drop seed or it already did drop the seed. Um, we did this burn and throughout the year I saw 16 little pines germinate um, in the burned area. Nothing in the leaf litter, nothing in the leaf blown area, but in the leaf litter I saw 16 little pine trees germinate and uh, none of them survived the year. Uh, I watched them for a little while, eventually they were gone, uh, and the possible reasons for this failing are a combination of these things. Genetics, one, this tree probably selfed um, or uh, had some you know, maybe some contact with another tree from somewhere with pollen. Um, so the genetic diversity is probably not real great. Um, it was a very dry early spring that year. So that could have, you know, slowed down the germination until it was a point where it wasn't wet enough after that to, to have staying power. And you can see it's pretty, it's pretty crowded. There's a lot of trees around. Um, this tree does stick well up over the top of the others around it, even though it doesn't really look like it in this picture. Um, and, you know, maybe little animals came and ate some of them too as a little vitamin C packed snack. Um, but regardless, um, we saw this place burned. We saw it regenerate 16 little trees and then they all died. Um, here's a picture, a, a drone photo that shows that tree sticking up and you can tell that it sticks up well above the surrounding trees. Uh, but this portion of the property is, is got very dense tree cover. Um, and if you just go this way into the Wiley Leopold, you can see that there's areas that are pretty open here. And in some of those areas, we have these great barren species that tell us, you know, this is a special place. It's not like all the other areas around. And, you know, what we see here is the bird's foot violets, uh, yellow star grass, and cream wild indigo. And cream wild indigo is a really special connector for these areas because um, we have existing plants. There's uh, about 12 to 15 plants that exist at Wiley Leopold on this ridge that I'm, that this is all taken from the same ridge. And um, we also have a record of those on um, the Bird's Foot Barrens property where uh, Nancy Grenard uh, and her husband Brad had sent in um, a record and some of the DNR guys came out and looked at it and they marked 11 to 50 of these cream wild indigo blooming um, in an open area. Uh, next just south of their house. And that area right now, um, just since 1988, has filled in to the point where there are no cream wild indigos in that area showing themselves. And uh, it's really uh, shaded out with um, shagbark hickory trees. This plant in the, in the bottom right is called moss pink. And this is one that doesn't have a record from Indiana, actually. Um, Any time this plant's been discovered, it's been determined that it's escaped from cultivation because it is a popular landscaping plant. Uh, but this is one that uh, Mike Kamoya sort of turned down making it an, uh, a first record for this in the 80s. But on a visit with him there, seeing them in multiple locations, he told me that he wasn't so sure that it wasn't. Um, a first record for the state. And so that's one that I'm going to be keeping my eye on as well uh, as part of this Barron's Habitat. I'll try not to go into too much aside about these other botanical things, but it is important to note that this is something that uh, they're very high light Barron's environments and that's, uh, you know, an indicator of where these white pines uh, will exist. Here's that same ridge. Uh, this is in the fall time. Obviously you can see Indian grass blooming there. There's little blue stem grass. Um, elm leaf goldenrod, um, gray goldenrod. Uh, this is after we did a prescribed fire. There was a big boom of Spiranthes orchids that bloomed around, and this is an agrostis grass species. I believe this is autumn bent grass. Um, just some, some things that are, you know, barren species. Okay, so now moving on to the next section in the birds, in the Black Rock Barrens at Bird's Foot Barrens. This is a, the area that was owned by NC Grenard, and we added in 2014, I believe. Um, this property has a huge white pine tree that you can see on this winter aerial. 
And this ridge right here uh, is very barren, uh, siltstone. Also has lots of aquamarine fruticose lichen that covers this area. And um, you can really see that popping out there. Uh, I did a record for this uh, to uh, put it in the Indiana Natural Heritage Database of the pine population. And these little pins are marking the trees that I found on that day. Even though there's only one tree on this ridge that's a big, you know, seed producing mother tree, there are, you know, about 30 trees on this ridge and they extend well far away from uh, where the mother tree is at. And so uh, that's sort of an indicator of okay, well, um, these are still regenerating with just one tree. So the ones on the other ridge are probably not due to light um, resources, uh, more so than, you know, genetic issues or, or um, uh, other, other issues holding them back. So this property, uh, we, we burned this in 2016, uh, same as the next ridge. And I have done just a little bit of work. Uh, some of the white pine trees over here are a little bit larger. And I have done just a little bit work to cut a couple of trees that are overtopping them to keep them around. White pine does respond to release. It can hang on um, in sort of a relatively shady environment, 10% sunlight. Um, once you hit that, past that 10% sunlight, they can really take off um, from the state that they're in. And so here's, I was just walking this property, um, taking some photos for this presentation and just keeping an eye on things. And I was able to find a little pine tree that looks like it's probably a 2017, class of 2017 seed, um, way far across the ridge, on the next ridge from this big one. Um, I didn't put this one here, it just came up. So that was a really encouraging thing to see that it traveled this far distance. Um, it's like right over here on this point. Um, so that was really uh, an encouraging thing to see is as we're doing fire thinning, removing invasives, um, we are still seeing these things try to Keep themselves alive. Here are some pictures from that ridge. This is the big tree over here and we also see you know these trees are about oh 15 feet or 20 feet tall. Um, there's several of those and then there's a lot of really small ones a couple years old. This one's one that's been around probably you know uh, eight to ten years or so and it has been browsed by deer which is a major issue um, that you need to account for. Here's the, the top of that large tree in 2017, and you can see it had a mass year just like the others. Um, we didn't see a huge amount of, of individuals come up from that, but there are some uh, trees from 2017 there that did recur naturally. On this ridge too, uh, also important to note the companion species of the barrens. Uh, this is a slender leaf uh, false foxglove. Uh, we have our Savannah Blazing Star, uh, Leatriscarius of Variety Newlandii, um, and then Goat's Rue, Tiprosia virginiana. This is one that also um, occurs at Black Rock. Uh, this is on the, the end of the bluff there. And you can see there's little blue stem and poverty oak grass and uh, lots of really cool barren species up on this ridge. Um, here's some more of, of, of those things. Uh, Sanguine, sanguinaria, or uh, sorry, polygolus sanguinaria, um, another indicator of the barren's habitat. And this is Darvilla lanicera, um, northern bush honeysuckle, which also occurs at Portland Arch, where they have uh, native pine trees. This is one of the trees uh, on the mid slope that um, looked like it was going to be safe from the fire, and so I didn't do any protection for it. And you can see. Uh, when we did the burn, there was a little run of oak leaf litter that went right up to underneath this thing, and it scorched it pretty good. Uh, but I'm happy to uh, say that this tree did fully recover. It just dropped all those dead needles and regenerated new ones, and it was fine. Um, so that was kind of a nice thing to see is that uh, they can survive being hit by the fire just a little bit. On this ridge, it's actually um, lots of mosses and lots of... Um, bare rock. So there are great opportunities for pines to find places in here where um, they can survive fire as a small tree. So uh, moving on through the barrens, uh, onto um, trees at Wally Morrison and Catherine Scott Moncrease property. Um, this is, this property is sort of connects up all the barrens uh, areas and uh, I had discovered that these pine trees were here by doing scouting on Google Earth and this image that you see right here. 
Um, I said, hey, there's pine trees over there. And so I've con contacted Wally and we went and uh, sat down and talked and looked at it. And he agreed that uh, he would be open to us, you know, doing some management on these on these areas. We agreed to include his property in a prescribed fire. Um, and we also did some other work on this property. So um, I made a report to the Indiana Heritage Database for this population. Uh, and when I did that, I had found five mature trees, two really big ones, which you can see at either end of the of the ridge there. 18 intermediate sized trees, three of which were dead from shading and 18 younger generation. Uh, we burned it in 2016 and then that summer actually came out and double girdled a bunch of black oak trees and some white oak and a couple sugar maples and uh, you know just open up light after that burn to see you know what can we get out of this will it regenerate more trees if we can you know get the light in the right places well I actually just went there to revisit um, on the 25th of this month so less than a week ago and those 18 young regeneration are now 120. Uh, they are seeing some browsing pressure from deer, but there's many that are not. Um, and so here's a good uh, look at the two large trees on either end. Um, the one on the left here is the northernmost one, and the one on the right is the one that's closer to the toe of the slope. And lots of little regeneration coming up. On the slope, here's a big clump of, oh, maybe 12 or so intermediate sized trees, which are well past damage, uh, the station where they would be damaged by any browsing or anything like that. Um, they're doing really well. Here is a shot showing, looking back up the ridge at some of the black oaks that I uh, girdled to allow more light to the, to the floor in here. Um, you can see the girdles down here. And uh, obviously that did us a lot of good. Um, so I prescribed fire and some thinning in there. Uh, there's no really a presence of invasives on the slope. So doing the fire and the thinning got us uh, a six fold increase in the amount of regeneration in just um, four years. And so, yeah, here's a couple more of the intermediate size ones that are overlooking the river, you know, right on that siltstone barren slope. And here's a shot of just, you know, the increase in these the small regeneration of these pines is has been remarkable. This area also includes cream wild indigo and uh, tephrosia and the Savannah Blazing Star and Rosa Carolina and um, lots of other companion plants that are part of this barren community. So uh, moving on slightly here. So at the bottom of the screen on the on the right, you can see there's the Birdfoot's Barrens population and then the Morrison population, and then up here is Black Rock. Well, uh, you know, this is just right in line uh, with what we're seeing for where these pines occur. Now, we know Black Rock was a, was a uh, well-used lookout point for, uh, for Native Americans uh, to scout up and down the river, and also it's been used for people to, you know, enjoy for partying and all those kind of things over the years. Um, so it has some really degraded spots on the top of the rock, but it's also got spots like this down below where uh, goats through, you can see that down in here. Uh, this is not a common species for the area, so it's a, you know, it's a good indicator. Uh, we also see false foxglove here, smooth false foxglove, an Orlaria species, um, and some Desmodium and some other things here. Really, really great um, habitat. And so uh, what we want to see here is this is one of the areas where this is the ridge here. Here's the ridge with the pine trees on the Morrison property up top. And on this ridge, we want to restore some pine trees. And the perfect area to do it is this spot where there was a black locust clone when I started with niches. And slowly, um, we worked on that, cutting out the trees and getting them removed from the site. And then um, we you know, worked on spraying re-sprouts and treating other ones that remain for a good long while. And now we've got this great spot where we could have these pine trees. and um, right below the area that was so degraded from those black locusts, it's black huckleberry and goats through and all these cool barren species. Um, and so this is sort of the, the natural progression here of uh, sort of managing these other areas and then doing some expansion. This is looking at the north side of Black Rock. Um, so on the other side of the road from where the parking lot and the promontory are, uh, the conditions are the same. Uh, you can see there's some bl blow down trees and up underneath them, it's just rock. I mean, uh, sandstone, siltstone, 
there's barely any soil in these areas and uh, this is a nice clump of poke milkweed where you know we've seen this plant around on these properties on the edges and stuff but when there was this big blowdown and all this light came in this poke milkweed plant came into this huge clump in here um, and you know that's not the only one I'm seeing I also uh, you can see on the left hand side of the frame here is an ash tree um, this is an area sort of on that north side down on a higher terrace where uh, there was already an open space with some uh, common wood reed and some other highlight species and then as these ash trees died uh, I came across after our first prescribed burn there this great clump of purple milkweed uh, which is something I see in small numbers and a lot of our properties and it's a savanna indicator species. So uh, what we were looking at there is this north side of Black Rock um, and again uh, all exposed stone and you can see the siltstone ridges here and this is this is sandstone uh, outcrops up on this part. All of this area around this north side of Black Rock is owned by um, Wally and Catherine. And not only have we done extensive invasive removal on this side of Black Rock and also subsequent thinning, two prescribed fires. Um, we're also engaged currently in a three-year quit program to remove all the invasives from all of this property as well. Uh, we've already made huge progress on that. And uh, in discussion with Wally, once we're done with that uh, invasive removal, we are going to move on to um, equip thinning uh, on this area. There is way too many um, hickory trees in this area, just super abundant, 100% uh, canopy closure. Um, and that is really hindering these barren species from, from doing their thing. So we're working here on our property to recover everything. And then we're expanding that work out into these other areas and sort of you know managing this as a huge barrens uh, area, which is what it is. Um, so another property here that doesn't have pine trees on it right now uh, is the Pottawatomie Trail. This is a property that we added in 2013, and we were able to take this area, which was a farm field, and it's been restored to uh, prairie vegetation. We do have. Um, our neighbor here, Jim Kreitz, has got a remnant area of some prairie species with royal catchfly, um, some Leatris pycnostasia, and a couple of other really um, interesting species, Hori vervain. Uh, we've helped him burn that a couple times, and I just found out not that long ago that we also, from inside of our footprint there, we have a record of Silene regia from this area from 1947 as well. Um, so we're working on all these things in conjunction and you sort of look at what's the next logical step for protecting these rare species that are in the area and you know planting pine trees makes a lot of sense. So uh, the very first test, which I'll go through that here in a minute, uh, we did some some seeding and some trees planted at Pottawatomie Trail and at Conkeys and that's kind of shown here on this little map, these little blue strips and green strips. The green strips is where I put some seed on the ground and the blue strips is where I planted a few trees and I'll talk about that here in just a minute. Uh, preparation at Parawami Trail has also been invasive removal and then in 2014 I thinned all these maples in the understory. You know you look through there every tree is a white oak basically in this area. Black oak, um, a little bit of shagbark hickory, but uh, for the most part every single tree in the understory was a sugar maple uh, really shading everything out. And so I cut these trees actually in February of 2014 and this is in September. So that first disturbance cutting all these trees really didn't yield us too much in there. Uh, there's a thick oak leaf litter layer on the ground and really we didn't see too much of a recovery in there. I really expected more out of it. And then we burned it. Uh, so in 2016, we had a prescribed fire. We burned the prairie restoration and all of the barren slopes. They burned beautifully, nice even lines of fire moving all the way across the property. Very dry in there. You can see that that wood has been sitting there on this barren's soil and, and uh, it's not often that you see them catch up like that but um, re really very dry. So we had a good burn post post thinning and now remember this one was in September 4th of 2014. Well here is September 18th, two full weeks later in the year of 2017. So this is three and a half years after the maple thinning and a year and a half after the fire and we see a robust recovery of the vegetation. Um, sedges increase, grasses increase, we see oak regeneration, we see um, elm leaves goldenrod is the yellow flower that's blooming everywhere. Uh, we saw our, our, a lot of our later season native asters 
uh, come back and in general, uh, this site is just recovering really, really well. And so you look at that and you go, okay, well, what's the next step? Well, this is in September of 2017 and that happened to be the mast year for the pine trees. So uh, you start to look at stuff and here's just an overview of the area that we just looked at, Little Pine Creek and the Black Rock Barrens. All of the orange um, polygons on here are our um, burn units that we've done uh, over the last five, six years. So really we've had great um, pressure from invasive removal, uh, thinning trees and doing lots of prescribed fire. Our most recent prescribed fire uh, was this 198 acre unit right here. We just burned that um, on March 8th of this month. An excellent fire, uh, covered really well. And that's gonna help us a lot with our invasive removal work. Actually, it's top killing all the rows and everything that still remains out there on Wally Morrison's property. And uh, we'll be attacking that, getting all these invasives removed. And so uh, we're also working on invasive removal in all these areas. I did all the honeysuckle and we've done reed canary grass work here, uh, Pottawatomie Trail. On Jim Kreitz's property, we've helped with some of that. Um, these people are named Dykstra's and they have done invasive removal on their property over the last few years. Uh, several years ago, I did all the invasive removal on uh, John Clemmie's property through an equip program where we were uh, refunded for that. And we did Louise Jewels over that same period slightly later. Um, and we were able to burn in there too. So uh, we've got a good burn in at, at Conkey's. And where you see it's darker, uh, Wiley Leopold has seen two burns on these slopes. And this north area here has seen two. The large burn unit here uh, has only been done one time. Um, but lots of fire. Lots of sort of landscape level work here. Okay, so kind of shifting gears now, uh, I wanna talk about the propagation timeline for you know growing these trees. What are we doing for our restoration material? So in 2017, we saw that mass year, uh, we were able to get a small amount of seed from several of these places where I was able to just get cones from the ground. I wasn't able to get to the tops of the trees in several areas, but I was able to get some seed from the bird's foot barrens, uh, from Black Rock Barrens tree. And not surprisingly, those isolated trees, their, their seedlings were not as healthy. Um, there was the occasional one that was in good shape and made it through, and I still have those trees now. Um, but a lot of them didn't do very well, um, and that is almost certainly due to, you know, low genetic diversity inside the, the seed. And so uh, we were able to get a large volume of seed from Crow's Grove with help from uh, Dana Goodman. He uh, worked his way up into the tops of a few trees, a few of the largest trees there, and harvested some cones for us. Uh, you have to actually collect the cones as they ripen in the tree because they release the seeds um, before the cones drop. Um, so you can get lucky and find a cone on the ground that still has seed in it sometimes, um, but the better move is to actually go up there, get them before they open, um, as they start to kind of turn purple, and then uh, we, we use several different methods to dry them. And um, the best method is to actually just take them, put them in a cool place and let them sort of dry out and open up on their own, shake the seed out of them, and then uh, you're good to go. Uh, so the first thing that we did was we harvested those seeds and separated them out, dried them. I put them in these jars down here. This is all of our seed, you know, like 10,000 seed or something uh, as an estimate. In September, I went ahead and stratified um, some from all eight treatments that we collected from and did a germination test on those. So uh, we did our first germination test in uh, the Lily Greenhouse in a collaboration with a botany class, which I do lots of those um, and always end up with growing some something in there. Uh, so we did this first germination test and um, the heat, we, we dried some of them in heat. That was one method that they said uh, and through reading, researching, how do you you know, do this? How do you propagate white pine trees? To say, okay, well, you can heat them up and they'll, that'll quickly sort of dry them out and open them. Well, the one that we heated, they all, there was no germination from that. So that's not a good method. Um, the germination rate was 23% after we did a cold moist stratification for 71 days. Um, and that was to do with the timing I had. Um, so I, I put them in there for 71 days. We took them out. Uh, we had only 23% germination, which wasn't great, but we did get 177 trees potted up just from the germination test. So that was something. Um, so we get our information and you say, okay, well, we can do better. Um, so January 6th in 2018, I put 3,073 seed in strat, and that's an, you know, sort of an estimate. 
um, where you count out a hundred and put them in the lid and then see, you know, what does that look like um, to get, you know, the other numbers out. So uh, the idea there was, okay, um, if we improve the germination rate um, and say it's 60%, well, then that's like, you know, 1500 or so trees that you're, that you're going to get out of there. Okay. Well, um, that's something that I could probably handle or do something with. So um, I set this all up. This is just at my house. Um, I put sand and soil from Crow's Grove, kept the, kept the pH low um, because my studies had told me that, you know, pH of 5.5 .5 is going to be the best germination rate. Uh, and I saw great germination out of this, this test run. Uh, I put them in for 90 days this time. So increased the stratification by 19 days and we increased our germination to about 50%. So that was great. So figured out um, best way to germinate them. And then uh, we potted these up. So on April 26th, uh, we had the last day of our AmeriCorps crew in 2018. Uh, we had them help me pot these all up and you can barely see them in there. They're just tiny little trees. Um, but all those uh, are 775 seedlings that we got um, and, and actually made it to being transplanted here. Um, I topped off all the all of the uh, containers with some soil from Crow's Grove to kind of try to add in the mycorrhizal uh, inoculant. I collected the seed from around the base of the existing trees. Uh, and we set up a rain barrel per um, sort of a recommendation from Guillermo Pardillo of Arbor America and said, hey, if you're watering with hard water, those precipitates will sometimes collect in there and um, create a more basic substrate and that might you know, hurt the growth of the plants. So we set up a rain barrel and, and watered them with that. Um, but unfortunately, right after we put them in there, there was a fan failure in the greenhouse and we had a, a hot day in the 70s and it got well over 100 degrees in this, in this little greenhouse. This is at Linda Anderson's house. And unfortunately, that caused some damage to the trees. And over the next month, about half of them died out. It's kind of a slow process. Um, but uh, the next day, after we potted all those up, I went out and took some of the plants from the original um, test germination run. You know, we've got these trees from uh, testing the germination, so might as well do something with them. Um, and so I planted about half of those, split between Potawatomi Trail and Conkeys. Um, they were at about four months age, four and a half months of age. And I also took some stratified seed. I put it in for 90 days. And um, so it was ready to germinate. And uh, I took that out there and I spread about 730 seeds at each site and planted about 40 seedlings at each site. The first time that we went out and did it, we didn't, we didn't protect them or anything. We just planted them. And uh, I discovered that um, rather than deer coming and browsing them, we we're actually getting uh, voles or mice or something. We're digging them up to eat the, the rich potting soil. And so, you know, that's something that you might experience at home when you plant stuff, uh, you know, animals will come and dig it up and uh, you're like, well, why did they do that? It's just sitting on the side. Well, I think they're just eating that sort of nutrient rich soil. And so uh, went back through and any ones that were dug up, I replaced them with another tree. And uh, from the 177 that I had from that initial, initial test run and we caged them. So um, put cages all around them. And so we're on, we're on our way. Over the summer, uh, lots of the trees didn't do that well, um, but we did end up with some that still were remaining. And uh, so the rest of the trees that I still had at home, I was sort of nursing them back to good health. They weren't uh, in great shape in the springtime. And those are the ones I kind of kept at home, got them in better shape. And then in the fall time, uh, we went out uh, September 27th. Uh, I went with Mike Murphy. And we planted 13 uh, remaining trees to replace the dead and missing plants at Potawatomi Trail. And this was a twofold exercise just to test for fall planting versus spring. Do they do better when you plant them in the fall? Um, and then also test for uh, planting at a little uh, more advanced age, you know, nine months versus four months. And they did have a significantly larger amount of roots and good buds when we planted in there. And then so uh, the other trees that were at Linda's, uh, as it started to get really cold, it's an unheated greenhouse, I decided to bring them home and care for them uh, for the winter at home underneath lights inside my uh, office here where I'm talking to you from now. And uh, there were some issues with that. So uh, doing more and more research, find out that 
you know, we think, oh, pine trees, evergreen trees, they are going to be active during the winter and that's a big advantage for them. Well, they're really not that active in the winter when it's cold because um, that sort of freezing doesn't allow for um, transport of fluids throughout the tree very well. So essentially what can happen is if uh, things are frozen and uh, the plants are really soaking up the light and doing photosynthesis, they can sort of burn up their machinery by um, not having water readily available moving through the plant and moving solutes. So they basically go dormant in the winter time as well um, in areas like where we are here when it gets nice and cold. And so uh, really these trees want to go dormant and uh, I was sort of denying them that by keeping them under these lights and their health started to turn a little bit. And so uh, I, I spoke to somebody at Purdue, another guy, Scott McAdam, who's doing uh, research on conifers and growing conifers. And he had a special kind of greenhouse set up and he said, well, bring them on in here and, you know, we'll put them in here and they'll just take off. And, and uh, you know, the conditions are great for them. Well, they had not gone dormant yet. And when we brought them in there, they didn't take off. They just kind of sat there. And uh, he tried to give them a little fertilizer, which they didn't really like. And um, sort of that experiment just didn't really work very well. Um, and so I took those trees back out um, uh, later on. And um, as we're doing this, I'm putting more seed into stratification. So um, yeah, November 6th, I have these trees at home. I put November 20th, I put more seed into stratification for the next round. Um, and then in February, uh, I brought the existing trees into Lily. Uh, they were cared for in there and we seeded um, a new round on February 22nd with the Botany 302 lab. Uh, we had that all set up in containers. We seeded two seeds in each one. And uh, it turned out that the third round of germination was a massive failure. Um, the seeds had been stored properly, but uh, something had happened where they had lost their viability um, by the time we had sowed them uh, for this third round. And I only got 10 to 15 uh, seedlings out of that round. So that was pretty disappointing. Um, sort of wringing my hands about what to do with these plants. And so uh, on May 29th of this last year, I brought all the trees home um, out of the greenhouse where it was getting way too hot for them anyway. Um, and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna take care of them here at home until it's time to plant them. So in May of 2019, this is me going back out to the field to Potawatomi Trail to check on the ones we had planted in the initial testing round. And uh, a few of the trees, uh, I think there was about six actually, and not just these three, but um, they actually started to put on new growth and were looking pretty good. These, all, these were all ones that were planted in the fall. Um, going back to conkeys, these are all ones that were planted in the spring. They don't look as good. Uh, so it looks like planting them out when they're four months old is not real good. And um, it seems like planting them out after nine months is just kind of okay. Um, they're doing all right and they're doing as well as the ones that naturally seeded in 2017. But I decided I wanted to get them into bigger pots and generate a little bit of a larger tree. Um, essentially what's happening when they're only about four inches tall is the leaf litter covers them over and you know any kind of plant that grows next to it overtops it and um, the root system's just not big enough for it to really take off. So uh, I spoke with uh, Guillermo again and he uh, lent me some materials from Arbor America, these 14 inch forestry pots. I went and picked up some soil and I made this little makeshift um, home for them, sort of elevated off the ground so they can drain and underneath my Norway spruce right by my driveway where they would essentially be under a 80% shade cloth, which is what is recommended for nursery growth in the summertime. Um, and this actually worked out really well. Um, I sort of did a thing inspired by the phenotyping facility at Purdue where I would just move them, rotate them all, uh, you know, every day or every two days. I just slide them all down one position and sort of rotate them one spot throughout the year. So any kind of disparate uh, light levels or whatever weren't just um, affecting these trees the whole time they were sitting there. Um, and so this is the, the next round here. So um, potting up all these trees, including the 10 or 15 that came from uh, the 2019 germination and all of the 2018 plants and uh, here they sat all summer long underneath the spruce tree at my house and I just felt like at the end of the year they weren't ready to be planted still they just hadn't grown that much they were still growing they were putting on roots they were gaining health but they just weren't ready to go out yet so 
So uh, this time I did something different. I decided to take the trees inside the garage and just let them sort of go dormant. Um, so I let them sit outside and let them get pretty cold down to right at freezing. And then when that happened and it was going to dip down to 22 degrees or something, I brought them all inside my garage and put them, you know, on these elevated areas. And I kept them in there and mostly dark at about 50 degrees for the whole winter. And, uh, you know, that was a sort of a leap of faith. And you sort of think, okay, well, I hope I don't kill them all. Um, but uh, it actually worked out really well. Uh, I, I watered them periodically, um, just a couple times throughout the winter. It would be a nice warm day in the 50 degrees or something. I'd move them all outside and give them all some water and then move them back in when it got cold again. And in March this month, I started bringing them outside into this. I moved the platforms to another area where they can get more sun and um, kept the trees in this spot. Um, as it has dipped to be really cold, I have brought them back inside. So shuffling them around, you know, you don't want uh, the roots to freeze in these containers. Uh, if they were in the ground, they would be fine. But since they're in the containers, the roots are kind of exposed. And you don't want, you know, 22 degree dip to kill all these trees that you've been growing and shuffling around for two and a half years, uh, trying to figure out how to do this. So uh, that's sort of a, uh, another whole timeline of what we've been doing. And basically the takeaways from that, from these test plantings, are that um, I didn't see anything come up from the seed that I spread at Potawatomi Trail and Conkeys. That was 730 seed. Um, they were stratified fully when they went on the ground, so they should have been able to germinate uh you know that was the best case scenario for them uh and you sort of compare that to crow's grove where we had all these millions of seeds fall in 2017 and we've got maybe 60 or so regeneration from there throwing seed on the ground is just not the way to get these things restored you, you need to have a couple year old tree um you need to protect it uh and planting them in the in the fall uh it seems to be the the better time to get them in the ground um, I am still going to split and plant some of them in the spring, but uh, essentially in, in September of last year, uh, there were three trees remaining at Conkeys and six at Potawatomi Trail, which is actually not that bad out of what we put in there, considering the trees were very young. Uh, these two pictures are from a tree at Potawatomi Trail from March 5th of this year. So they look uh, about the same as the ones I've grown from seed. Uh, and they look about the same as the ones that are naturally, naturally regenerated at Crow's Grove, um, where there's a healthy population. Okay, so going back into our sort of historical records and um, moving on to the Big Pine Creek. So that was all Little Pine and uh, the Black Rock Barrens, and then going through all the propagation um, that we've done with these trees so far. Now let's go and look at some more historical records. So uh, moving on up into the Big Pine Creek area, we see uh, here, this is a record from an atlas of Warren County. It was published in 1877, uh, which has lots of really cool information. It's got um, all these, it's got every town and then it lists all the people that work in all the towns and what they do and you, where you can get timber and uh, all, all, all this uh, interesting information about local businesses. And it gives a description of each township. And so the properties that we're actively working on at Crow's Grove and Warren Peace, Honey Branch Bluff, Swanson's Bluff, um, those are all in Liberty Township in Warren County. And the township that's directly north of Liberty Township is Pine Township. And inside of Pine Township, I, we see this description where they say, Pine Creek is a beautiful stream of water fed largely by springs. For over two miles, and that's just inside of Pine Township, the creek, by the constant washing of ages, has cut its bed deep into the subcarniferous rocks, leaving in many places perpendicular or overhanging banks of stone. The hardy pine fringes the stream on either side, helping to make up a beautiful and attractive scenery. Uh, he goes on to mention Point of Rocks, which is actually Rocky Ford, and he also mentions Island Rock in the Mud Pine Creek which is uh, something we know as Table Rock. Um, if you've paddled through the Mud Pine Creek, you've certainly come across that. Um, this section of the Big Pine Creek, we're not actually doing any work with pines in this area because we don't have any um, properties that have the substrate or um, uh, I'm not sure of where there are any extant existing pines here. But um, I did do an exploration with Brad on the Mud Pine Creek um a few years ago 
and we actually made our way from the Hewitt Estate down into the Big Pine Creek and on from there. And in the bottom left, you can see that's where the Table Rock is in the Mud Pine Creek. And up here on the map, you can see um, where we actually spotted some um, some listed species, and that was a couple of locations of Forbes saxifrage and also some white pine. Um, I had never seen any record of white pine on the Mud Pine Creek, but here you can see, you know, the sandstone is there, and um, you can see here's a white pine, and here's a white pine, and here's a close-up of that. This is a red cedar, and then here's a little white pine, um, and there was also a big broken off stump of a big old white pine here. And I was able to go look at the 2005 winter aerial on Google Earth and find that location. And it matched up to where I had recorded it here. So we do see up in the Mud Pine Creek, uh, we see some remnant pine remaining. And also um, in the upper sections of the Big Pine Creek where we don't have any properties. Uh, so looking at some more of those original land survey records from the Big Pine area, uh, Mike Moya helped me out uh, as I was doing this project. He sort of gave me some guidance and gave me some help in doing some research because they have these land survey records in the Indianapolis office where he was working. And so he went through and he found a couple of them in our area of interest along the Big Pine. He found one from uh, their survey in this area was in 1824. And he found one between sections 15 and 16 of Township 22 North Range 8 West. It says land third rate timber, oak and hickory with some scattering of pine, but none of value. Um, and then we also see one from 1824 uh, between sections nine and 10, which is actually um, the, the same line north and south. Those, those section lines line up with each other. It says uh, first half mile prairie, thin sandy soil, last half mile third rate oak, or timber, oak, hickory, and some few scrub pine. So let's look at the map where we see this area between sections 15 and 16. Okay, here's section 16, here's section 15, and here's the line that he's describing, with the few scattered white pines. This is our Swanson's Bluff property that was donated by Bob and Roy Kuhlman here um, at the very beginning of 2019, uh, or maybe December of 2018. And uh, this property, has got existing white pines on it. I've known about them because of paddling down the creek for years. But um, yeah, if you look through here, it says that in 1824, there was just a few scattering of white pine. Well, what does that look like now? Pretty impressive. Uh, those white pines, uh, several of those are very large individuals. And um, most likely those are the ones that are described from the 1824 land survey. Um, and just at that time, there would have been small trees, uh, not of any consequence to anyone, but they were noted. Um, and so now we can see, without intervention, you know, what has happened to this area since 1822. Well, you know, 150 years of growth on these trees, they're doing really well on this side. They have a nice open space right above the creek. They've got perfect substrate. Um, and so that's what that looks like. Uh, now looking at the other record here that we have, which is Actually, um, this section line is shares the east boundary with Honey Branch Bluff. Um, and what they list there was a uh, first half mile prairie. So that would have been this farm field and partially into um, what is now fully wooded here. Uh, sandy soil and the last half mile, which would have been this area. Um, third rate timber oak and hickory, some few scrub pine. Now, uh, before at the beginning, I mentioned that they say, oh, well, sugar maple and, and oak have probably outcompeted in the more music areas. And that's what we see here is that, you know, away from the creek, we don't see any pine trees in here, but on the sandstone bluff up here, there are nine um, intermediate mature aged pine trees on this rock bluff. Um, they're, they're good size, but there's no big, you know, old, old 150, 180, 200 year old trees, um, but they do still exist up here. And um, we have done a lot of work on this property. I'll sort of go into a little more detail on that now that we've uh, established our early, early records there from the 1820s. Um, now let's look at this. This is um, comparing, again, the suitable habitat with where we see the extant trees. Uh, and you can see where that residuum soil, the tan colored soil is poking out. Um, there are pine trees right here. And actually it doesn't map this location because it's a really small exposure but there is ex exposed sandstone and residuum soil there, and there are um, existing white pines in that location. 
also existing white pines on this rock bluff here. And Crow's Grove is our biggest population and our seed source for everything we're doing here and um, a really important part. And you can see here, nice big section of residuum soil, which actually continues on down to the creek um, and also over here into the tributary stream. So just looking at this little small section here, let's take a peek at Crow's Grove. I'm sure a lot of people have been there um, that are on this, on this uh, presentation right now. Uh, this is actually me uh, and Brad and Andrew Reuter, our regional ecologists, um, taking an early look at Crow's Grove just after it was donated to us by Martha in uh, her estate plan in 2015. That was Martha Pugh. Um, and so this is our largest population of white pine with 12 large mother trees and hundreds of intermediate and small trees. Um, I think we counted, oh, 460 some or something a few years ago. Um, this site has seen extensive invasive removal, a couple of carefully implemented prescribed fires that excluded the areas with the young pines, so we didn't set back our population there. Um, and we're actually seeing regeneration from that 2017 mast year, and I went ahead and protected all those little young regeneration with cages so I could make sure to keep an eye on them and sort of monitor them as they go. And you can see in these pictures, it's the same spot, um, lots and lots of understory thinning has gone on up to this point, um, prescribed fires and sort of vegetation has settled down. And in here you can see barely, um, and these will be in another picture, little cages where I've found the, the white pine regeneration in this spot where there was none before. Um, everything is natural at Crow's Grove. I haven't planted anything or moved anything. Um, we're just letting this population um, sort of expand and thrive with the management. So here's the winter aerial that uh, this is the first thing that I looked at when uh, Gus told me that this property was coming to us and he said, oh, I think there's a few white pines out there. And I looked at this thing and I said, oh, that looks like uh, a bunch of white pines. And so um, we do have a really nice population here, large trees um, on both sides of the Sandstone Canyon and they sort of expand out into this area. And there is some regeneration over in this area far away from um, the existing trees about to the edge of where they can exist. Um, we also see here um, something that we see at the other places, and I just sort of want to include this like I did with the Black Rock Barrens, that we also see savanna species and barren species existing near here. And that sort of like lets us know that the surrounding area to these pine trees has been in an open habitat for quite some time. So things that we see here, this is uh, Robin's Plantain or a Rigeron uh, Pucellus. This is a, a savanna indicator species. Uh, we have our yellow star grass, uh, also uh, Virginia spiderwort. This is our black huckleberry in bloom, um, uh, a hairy hawkweed, and some shooting stars um, that are all found around where these great um, pine trees are, are located. Really nice population grown right on the sandstone rocks. And here's just an example of trees that were released um, early. Uh, these, these were trees that were um, not from 2017. They had already, they were already existing or starting to germinate um, in 2015 or 2016. And these trees have absolutely thrived. Uh, they just look super healthy. They look happy. Uh, they had a lot of extra light added in. Um, that's been through understory thinning, extensive thinning by us of small stem trees. But also uh, we had a couple of Canopy trees lose their tops, some uh, big tooth aspen and a black oak lost their canopy tops in a big storm. And uh, that light has really, really helped um, the development of this population. And here you can see, these are regeneration from the 2017 mast year. They look very similar to the ones that I have in containers still right now. And um, they're doing really well. Uh, these ones are on this side of the creek. Uh, and here's the chunk of one of the larger trees on this side, very impressive tree. Uh, but there were no small regeneration on the side, only large trees until we did our invasive removal, did our thinning, and did a couple of prescribed fires in here, uh, carefully making sure not to damage the pines as we went. Uh, but we are seeing, you know, great success in here. And so this is that other area that I had showed before. You can see the little green cages, and they've got those 2017 regeneration in there. This whole area had no smaller trees, and now it's got um, about 40 small trees that we've, that we've caged in there. Uh, moving over to our conservation easement. We 
added Crow's Drive in 2015. We added a conservation easement on the Warren Peace property that's um, along the Big Pine Creek there, very close to Crow's Grove. We did that in, in 2016. This property has one large mother tree, which you can see there next to a shagbark hickory, which I um, girdled uh, in order to allow it to keep its space there. Um, that shagbark hickory was casting shade on a large portion of that tree and uh, I sacrificed it to um, improve the health of the mother tree that we had there on site. This area, we've done some, uh, some light thinning of smaller sized trees around where the pines and we've seen the regeneration double um, since doing that work. Uh, these trees are doing well, they're healthy. A lot of them are growing on this moss uh, in this area which would have historically protected them from fire. They like to germinate and grow in the moss because it does lower the, the pH. Um, this is an adjacent area there of really um, gravelly outwash, and that has got uh, red cedars on it. This year, we were actually able to do our first prescribed fire on the slopes there at, um, at Warren Peace. Uh, great burn uh, following sugar maple thinning. Uh, most of the trees were, the pine trees were fully protected from, you know, just not having oak leaf litter around them on the mosses and things. Uh, there were a couple that were not protected here and did get burned and we'll have to see if those return or if they're just roasted away. Um, but I would expect to see some uh, regeneration in these areas. The, the mother tree there did have a lot of cones on it last year. So we may see a flush um, this year in that area of some more trees coming in. We'll keep monitoring that and uh, doing some selective thinning and things there. And uh, here you can see the pine tree in this area. Uh, and then this is a sandstone bluff um, down along the way that uh, could be a potential spot to get some more trees going. Uh, Honey Branch, Branch Bluff, I mentioned this one uh, before. Things that we've done here, this is one of the pine trees here. Um, they're not, uh, like I said, they're not the huge pine trees, but there is nine, you know, well past the danger of being browsed or anything. Um, they've got plenty of light coming to them. This property, we've done extensive invasive removal, including lots of uh, multi-floor rows. It's kind of covering the whole property. We were able to do a really hot prescribed fire there in 2018 and uh, sort of mm, the end of our fire season in April. Uh, it did a lot of work for us, including top killing almost all of the trees that were uh, three inches and smaller, and uh, also top killing all the rows, which then re-sprouted, was attacked by fungus, um, and died back and then the following year I was able to go through and spray out you know all of the rows on this property so it's basically invasive free right now. Um, we also saw um, a thinning project through here we thinned out lots and lots and lots of maples um, particularly in that area that was described as Sandy Prairie um, in the 1820s and so we did a lot of thinning there uh, and fire invasive removal and of the things we've been rewarded with are just these great you know regrowth of all the cool species of uh, black huckleberry and um, dogwoods and service berries and then these really neat um, uh, violet species which is uh, maybe viola palmata or uh, bernardii which uh, even asking Mike Moya he wasn't didn't want to commit without seeing the flowers um, but then we also see you know liparis orchid here and you know, lots of uh, fire pinks, um, two flower dandelion, Krigia biflora, and another indicator, um, the violet wood sorrel, Oxalis violaceae. So uh, that's our little top section of the Big Pine Creek. Now moving down just to the next adjacent area to the south, um, we're gonna look at our available habitat once again, all the residuum soils here and up into these ravines along the, along the creek and into Fall Creek Gorge, where uh, we also have uh, white pine trees exist there. Um, and yeah, these there's white pines all along this edge, all along this edge, um, all through this section, there's lots of them. And so going back to Swanson's Bluff, where we see these big trees along the roadside, here's another section looking up uh, on the south end of Swanson's Bluff through this really nice sandstone barrens area. Um, all the red leaves that you can see in the bottom there, are actually black huckleberry. Um, and this is a really diverse little section that's got these great white pine trees in it as well. Um, this property came to us through donation from Bob and Roy Kuhlman in 2018. And we've already done lots and lots of work on this property, invasive removal over the whole thing, lots of thinning, um, 
uh, we did a extensive oak savanna restoration along the western edge of the property over the open grown white oaks. And again, I mentioned that uh, because it's important for these pines. Um, pine oak barrens, you know, they exist generally in a strip of habitat that's connected to prairie or savanna or something that's keeping the light levels high. So uh, where we're positioned at here, the light levels are increased because of the Big Pine Creek on the east side and also because there's um, savanna habitat and open areas uh, on the east side as well. And some of those companion plants at Swanson's Bluff, um, things that we just see um, in, in these places, again, uh, black huckleberry and New Jersey tea, really great population of that there, maple leaf viburnum, we see showy goldenrod and gray goldenrod, um, and even um, some interesting things like Lesbediza species, Lesbediza herta, frutescens, and virginica, um, just lots and lots of indicators that are just telling us that this is a special location. Um, here is, are some of those things. Um, here is New Jersey tea. There's like 12 or 15 of these big, beautiful clumps. I've never seen this on another Barron's property in this area ever. Um, and our, our Lesbediza species. And then this is a really cool one. Um, sarsaparilla, this is one that I see up in our sand country savannas. Uh, uh, in big numbers, but I've never seen it down here. And so this is the first time I went through and did some research on that. And I actually found out that Charles Dean collected one along the Big Pine Creek. And he says, a rocky wooded bluff along Pine Creek about one mile north of Kramer, plentiful here. Uh, that was on May 18th of 1917. And looking at the map, you draw a line from Kramer up and measure it. Swanson's Bluff, where this is at, is right here directly exactly a mile north of Kramer, uh, which leads me to believe that it's almost uh, certain that Dean was collecting sarsaparilla at uh, our Swanson's Bluff property, which is really, really cool. Um, this is another shot from there, indicator species of savanna, purple milkweed. We also have this Thaspium chapmanii species that occurs with it. This occurs at Swanson's Bluff and also on the roadside uh, on the west side of Crow's Grove. And then here's some shots of the Savannah area that we have been restoring over all of 2019. These really beautiful open grown white oak trees uh, that are, you know, likely 180 years old or something like that, 150 years old. Uh, and we've done extensive work under there to remove invasives, to thin out the understory trees. Uh, I guess that underneath these trees, there's probably at least 40 small black cherry and, and walnut trees underneath here. And, uh, you know, this is an important part of not just the pines, but the holistic part of the property where we're using these historical records. Um, this is one that's from, uh, lists the Siltlum Savannas, uh, one of them being uh, at the Briscoe Cemetery, which is just um, actually right on the border of our Hewitt State property up on the Mud Pine Creek, just um, a few miles north of this property. Uh, and so, you know, using this, as a guide to get the right species. And then also using some things up from Wisconsin from this guy named Thomas Brock, who kind of gives us this, um, this is where you put these things. This is where they belong. So, you know, Agastasia, Scrofulariaceae, purple hyssop, we've got this species, uh, the species occurs at um, our Whistler Hare Woods property, which I'll talk about here in a little bit. Um, and it's a, it's a savanna indicator. And so it grows in only 10 to 30% canopy here. And so um, this is sort of a guide for how do you put these things in. Um, this is our mix, 131 species that we collected over and, and purchased over um, 2019 and put on the ground. Uh, really great diverse mix of plants. Um, lots of stuff from our, our remnant populations and um, also a lot of stuff from Spence Restoration Nursery. Um, and that was all planted in a zoned mix here where we have full sun species from the savanna mix, and then partial sun and shade mix here, um, a whole other set of species um, in those areas. And so as you look at this, you know, you see the pine trees are on this side of the property. Well, as you keep this area open savanna-like, that's gonna benefit these pines and sort of let them mesh um, into a naturalized barren's habitat here. Um, and so another thing I wanna point out here is there are pine trees up this way as well. And then if you stand right here on the bank of the creek, at Swanson's Bluff and you look downstream, you know, this is what you see. Uh, another really um, striking 
uh, rock outcrop with lots of big pine trees on it. These these trees are definitely within um, pollination range of our trees. Um, and that's what we want to see is the trees, the naturally occurring trees should be within a kilometer of each other to be able to transfer pollen um, and keep genetic flow happening up and down the stream. And it's not that far out um, from that being a reality. And so with a little help, we can make that happen. Here are some pictures of where uh, pine trees exist also at the Fall Creek Gorge. The site is owned and managed by the Nature Conservancy. And uh, you can see in this area, this place, this area has not been burned. Uh, there's not, um, there's a lot of Carpinus and uh, Arstraya, uh, musclewood and ironwood trees that are kind of choking this area out. Um, the trees are pushed all the way up to the edge of the, of the creek. And here's, you know, a few of them, they're just kind of clinging onto the edge. Um, these ones are, are experiencing some damage, uh, limbs breaking off, um, a couple eagles in that photo as well. Um, and there are some small white pine trees here that are still kind of clinging on on this edge, but man, they're not doing very well in here. Um, this is another spot at Fall Creek Gorge. This is near where the potholes are. Um, and again, you know, these trees have been here. Dean marked these trees, uh, you know, in the flora, he talks about them. And, um, you know, they're here, but they're not really growing or anything. They're waiting to be released. Um, and so you can also see here's a pine tree on this other side at Fall Creek Gorge. And here's all, you know, savanna type vegetation across the creek. It's consistent throughout the valley. Um, so here's sort of, a, you know, looking at the map, these are the areas that we just talked about here. Here's Crow's Grove up in this very, very far top, Swanson's Bluff, go through Fall Creek Gorge. And there's a few more locations here that have these big white pines. And then all of a sudden there's none. Well, what's going on there? Well, this whole section of the, of the big pine runs through what used to be uh, a, the valley that was a tributary stream that went into the Taze River. Back before the Wabash River was formed, the Taze River uh, was the drainage for the central, central part of the state here. And this whole area um, is actually completely filled with multiple deposits of glacial till very, very deep and all the sandstone and siltstone is covered up in this spot. Um, this is actually, Lover's Leap is in this section, which is actually a really famous spot for a study of glaciation and soils where they finally determined that um, these areas had seen multiple glaciations where they could identify till from uh, the Erie lobe and the, and the Mich uh, Michigan lobe uh, glaciation. But then as you get down into the southern part of the stream, you start to pick up the pine trees again. Uh, the sandstone is exposed and siltstone is exposed again. And this lower section of the creek, you know, you can see lots of good habitat here. And that's mirrored with, you know, I marked these with a line because there's so many of them in here. There's lots of pine trees in this area. Um, and these are some pictures from those areas. This is on a float trip where we went all the way out into the Wabash and took out an Attica. And you can see that there's places that have really impressive mother trees down here and would be great to work in. Um, I hope that we can sort of get a beat on uh, how we can do some work in this lower section of the valley. Uh, this is more similar to the Black Rock Barrens area and that this is almost all siltstone uh, exposed down here. And I also have found uh, up on some really high rocks, um, cream wild indigo, you know, and it's, it's at the same distance from the river basically. Um, as they are in the Black Rock Barrens area. And um, so that's something else to look forward to. Now, um, now that we looked all the way through uh, Black Rock Barrens and all of um, uh, Little Pine and a Big Pine Creek, let's go just a little bit um, south and east of the Big Pine Creek to the Kickapoo Creek. Um, this is another excerpt from John Collette. Uh, this is one where there's a question mark for the section number. And previously, I just sort of you know, okay, well, he mentions pines here. On the summit, ancient pines seem to wave their somber plumage against the blue sky and cast down their cones as an offering to the fay of the fountain. Um, and so, okay, well, there's another record, but I'm not sure where this is. Well, it turns out that I was able to find, um, he has Warwick's, uh, this is actually, he says Warwick, uh, but Mrs. Warwick or Warwick, um, this is the same property and there are some sort of uh, calibrating clues here that he gives. Um, that allow me to figure out that this is the place. And so one, he gives this description of the, the bedrocks and through there. And then he says, a short distance east of the Warwick Cascade and about 250 yards west of the Kickapoo Mills, the subcarniferous rocks again rise above the level of the Bottoms Road. And he describes that area. And basically what that is, is, you know, a short 
distance east of the work land and 250 yards west of the Kickapoo Mill, which is this marked as a grist mill here. Um, the Bottoms Road, which is this, um, the, the bedrock is exposed here again in this spot. So with those calibrating areas, we've determined that that is this area um, that he's talking about and he, and he mentions the pines from. And then looking at the uh, bedrock description, uh, it looks really familiar. So here's a map where um, we have an estate plan property here and we have a property that we purchased to build a stewardship facility on here. Um, and these little purple marks are actually from a state geologist about a decade ago came and marked all the waterfalls. Okay, so these are all waterfalls here. And the grist mill is right up here and the bottoms road goes this way, all the same. And then here is a picture of that exact spot that he's mentioning, all the same. Uh, it's got the black rock pebbly sandstone at the top, irregularly bedded uh, sandstone here. And then you sort of get into the bit of a shale and uh, gray and blue gray shale in the bottom of that. And so this is an area where, uh, again, he records the pines here. There are none there at this juncture. I have seen on the, on the winter aerial that there are likely some locations that still have pines in the Kickapoo Valley, uh, but I haven't seen any of those in person. Uh, and here's another good example of why those trees are probably gone. Uh, there's a railroad bed that runs right through this property um, and it would have been really easy to get those trees right onto this uh, railroad and moved out of this property. So uh, with that record, uh, then let's go ahead and move into Fountain County and we're about, about through the presentation here, almost wrapped up. Um, these are uh, areas where we have some existing trees and where we also wanna do some expansion. So this is looking at the Big Shawnee Creek as a drainage in the north there to the Wabash River. And in the bottom uh, is Bear Creek going through Portland Arch. And in the middle is Shawnee Bottoms is, is uh, connects all of that in the middle now. So uh, here's a picture with the boundaries, Portland Arch down here, Shawnee Bottoms right here. And this is our new uh, Whistler Hare Woods property, which um, a great addition as also has existing remnant white pine. Um, here's a photo that I took from Indiana Historical Society, and this is the remains of the Wabash and Erie Canal at the mouth of Shawnee Creek. And so uh, that puts us right at the northeast corner of Shawnee Bottoms, where we have exposed rock right here. And so this whole section uh, running down here where we have this exposed sandstone is sort of marked on this map here we uh, had a railroad that ran right by here. And so, uh, you know, any trees that were of any harvestable value or whatever, they would have certainly been cut and uh, loaded on there. The Wabash and Erie Canal runs right through there and that railroad runs um, right on the old path of the canal. So uh, that's a good explanation for why there's no trees there now. Um, here is the Whistler Hare Woods and this incredibly striking sandstone rock house. Um, that is just completely stunning. And up above this, there are some white pine trees right over our heads. Um, and the nice thing about this property is that they're kind of spread out. So here, here it is uh, looking um, sort of from um, the Northeast, looking back at the stream valley, you can see um, this is where that big rock house is at. Um, you can actually kind of see the pine trees here on this edge. There's also some here and some here and a single mature one here. Um, this is all suitable habitat where the rock is exposed through these areas. Um, it's just these areas are exposed to light um, quite a bit. They're, they're sort of southwest and southeast facing in there. Um, so they've been able to retain their light. Um, they also have lots of cool companion plants that uh, you know, speak to the, the originality of the, of the lineage there. So here is an example of me just jumping right on doing some thinning in these areas uh, where we've got these pine trees. You know, I did some major release um, of the surrounding trees, mostly sugar maples, but um, a few other things in some cases. But uh, you can see the top two are just showing, you know, afters where the trees have been thinned down. And same thing here, um, doing some thinning down below this bluff. And then this bottom one is a before and after of the single pine tree. And you can see just how much these are just twigs that are shading this and sort of make it look, um, you know, you can hardly see it there. And this is just right after when I finished. Um, so we do have that area there and we do see some of these really cool companion species too. This is the one I mentioned 
um, Agastache scrofularifolia. That's uh, the purple giant hyssop, and we did find that out there, as well as Lismachia lanceolata is another sort of barren species that we just don't see everywhere. And uh, we see, this is a red mulberry here, Morris rubo, which we see at a lot of these properties as well. So again, taking another perspective here, um, looking for, from the Northwest, you can see this is where our existing trees and all this cool sandstone substrate all the way through here. And that just continues all the way through the section of Shawnee Bottoms here. And it's just sort of one um, big, long, uh, connected habitat. Uh, it just so happens that the towpath of the Erie Canal and the former railroad went right by all these areas. And my guess is that's why we don't see any pine trees there today and why I'd like to restore them there. This is uh, the neighbor's property just right here um, as you get almost to our property. Um, this is on Greg Fisher's property. It's a cool little waterfall, um, seasonal thing, but uh, still really neat. And then as you move into Shawnee Bottoms, this is what it looks like. Um, we have a uh, state endangered Forbes saxifrage and some cool um, sandstone rock species, uh, McKay's Southern Fragile Fern, and um, you know all these little rock grottos kind of continue throughout the property. Here's another one, um, and just similar to all, all the other places, you know, uh, we have the spot where the pines would go, and then we're doing all this work to restore highlight habitat um, uh, downstream in the light, or sorry, upstream in the light shed, where um, this area right here, you know, we've got our exposures here, sandstone. This area right here was um, sort of had some corn in it. It was like a deer plot before we bought this property in 2015. And uh, we've discovered all these cool prairie plants on this edge here, you know, not just savanna plants, but this Orbex uh known as French grass. This is a prairie plant. And um, we also see Solidago junkia. And I mean, this is not some little tiny remnant. This is like, you know, um, easily, you know, 500 feet of thick growth of this really cool species. And we also see spreading dog band in there, which is another indicator, Aplocinum and Um And then here's sort of a more interior area where a lot of maples were thinned and we've burned a couple of times in this area. And I see Carrick swanii and Festuca subverticillata. Some um, also, you know, Carrick swanii is like a, a, a savanna sedge species. And here it is in this area where I thinned a ton of maple trees down and we burned a couple times and, you know, we saw um, lots of great um, uh, highlight species come up in there. And so just to, just to wrap this up, everybody's familiar with the Bear Creek and the, the pine trees uh, in the Portland Arch area. Well, that habitat also continues this way. And of course, the Town of Fountain is in here over some of the sandstone. But Niches now owns this area here of, uh, of sandstone exposure. Um, and also up here, um, on this bluff is the same Judyville fine sandy loams where these pine trees exist on the same, you know, ridge level here. And uh, unfortunately, uh, these areas were heavily logged by the previous owner as we were going through neg negotiations to buy these properties, uh, which made a real big mess of these areas. But it also opens up an opportunity for um, a little continued work to keep the area in high light conditions and um, hopefully we can restore some pine trees to these areas. Um, so if you go down this section of the towpath, you'll see this a rock wall just kind of extends this whole direction all the way down to the town of Fountain. Um, and same deal over here on that other upland section that I was mentioning. It's, this is all just very uh, thin sandstone residuum soils and um, this area actually goes into a slot canyon off of our property, and it actually has this Forbes saxifrage in these in these grooves. So, um, just sort of basic plan moving forward with all this information. Um, hopefully, everybody's still with me out there after this marathon uh, explanation. But uh, what we're going to do is we're going to manage the existing populations as we have been, um, being careful not to damage anything with fire, but also releasing uh, these places so that they can, you know, freely regenerate on their own. And if they can do that, then great. And we don't have to plant any trees there. Um, and uh, also, you know, prioritizing our acquisitions of places with pines and barrens in mind. Um, and I think we should be working to expand the populations in the macro sites, like looking at the Black Rock Barrens. You know, we've got them through, you know, 70% of this area and we have the habitat. We're already opening up, uh, burning and uh, creating conditions that are going to be conducive to these pines surviving if they were still there. 
Um, so moving up into, you know, Black Rock and Pottawatomie Trail and, and planting trees there makes a lot of sense. Um, also at Conkey's where we have our historic record. Um, we need to keep watching for seed collection opportunities. When are we going to have another mast year? And we need to be on top of getting seed from as many of these places as we can, even if um, the populations are small, we can still get some seed from that and, you know, include that in plantings where we can put some genetics from that tree um, into a mix of uh, trees that are from places that have more genetics like Crow's Grove. Uh, and the idea will be to plant uh, small amounts of the available seed seedlings that we can produce from local seed each year at the restoration locations. And that way, over time, we'll add a small amount of trees to each place that will allow for mixing of local genetics in the future and the regeneration will be all, you know, sort of local um, uh, genetics from these different locations and also will result in populations with diverse egg structure. So, you know, if you're planting some trees every three, four, five years, um, you're going to have different age trees at the site instead of just planting 100 trees at one, one location in a year and then they're all even aged. Um, that's not really exactly what we want. So uh, distribution of the current seedling stock that I've got on hand. Um, I've got 25 trees to go to Weiler Leopold on the ridge with a single mother tree. Uh, we probably need to do some oak thinning on that ridge as well, uh, similar to what I did on Wally and Catherine's land uh, in order for those trees to be able to survive. Uh, everything will be caged too, or at least um, protected in some way. Um, and then I want to do 25 trees to two locations at Black Rock, one uh, near the Outlook overlook where we've removed a black locust clone and one on the north side of the property where um, there's a particularly nice location where it will um, easily retain light for these trees to, to maintain themselves and get to a, a height where they can survive long term. 25 more trees back to Pottawatomie Trail and Conkeys where we did our initial tests. Um, we, we will uh, sort of add to those populations with another 25 trees at each location. And then I also have one set to put 25 trees at the Honey Branch Bluff immediately south of the current group of pines on that property. Um, we've got about nine there. There's a large canopy oak that recently fell and created a really nice opening, you know, right near where the south end of that pine uh, group begins. And so the idea there is you bring some genetics from Crow's Grove just up and over the creek and put them on the south end of that. And in the future, um, as they mature and the other trees mature, they'll be able to uh, genetically mix with some local ecotype and drop some good healthy seed, hopefully on the ground there. And with that, um, that's the end of the presentation here. Um, hopefully lots of people are still with us here and enjoyed what I had to say. Um, and I will now throw it back to Gus here and uh, see what we're gonna do from this point. Uh, great. Yeah, I got, I'm talking again. Um, uh, thank you, Bob. Um, and uh, at this point, basically there, if anyone has anything, questions they want to throw out there, I'll unmute everybody. Um, we'll just take our time and uh, um, we'll go through questions both in the chat room. I will just unmute it and deal with the chat room. Bob, you can deal with any questions that are asked of the directly. Be happy to. Great work, Bob. Thank you. This is a, a good presentation too. Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Bob. Yeah, no problem. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate it. Very informative. Nice presentation. I appreciate that. It's uh, a lot of work over the last five, six years to uh, to get to this point and pouring back all through all these records and information has been pretty exhausting. Uh, and giving the presentation has gotten to be pretty <laughs> exhausting too, but uh, really great to to bring such detailed information and uh, have some people here to to listen to it. Uh, Bob, I'm new. Uh, your email address? Uh, RL Easter at nicheslandtrust dot Bob, this is Wally Morrison. Look, what are, what are the things that you need the most to keep this? To keep your forward momentum, do you need people? Do you need, um, you know, what what kind of resources do you need to keep going and may and expand? Well, uh, you know, something I would really like to see is some of the other partner organizations like uh, DMP and TNC start to get into doing some of this work on their properties and possibly being able to collect seed and grow trees, um, so that it's not such a, you know, a burden on me to actually do all that stuff. Um, you know, at this point, uh, I'm sort of limited on how many trees I can grow 
um, just because we don't have location to really do it outside of, you know, having them at home, you know, they need daily attention um, usually. So, uh, you know, we're looking at building that stewardship uh, uh, home where we could hopefully, you know, do some more stuff like this in the future. But, you know, with our, you know, issues right now with the uh, uh, financial you know, problems that are going on with this virus and stuff. Uh, we're probably going to be putting that location on hold for a little while. Um, but really, you know, things are going well. Uh, and, you know, going back through all this, I feel like I had to, you know, go through this learning curve to figure out, you know, what exactly is going on um, and, and where can we, you know, uh, you know, what is the right approach to do these things? I feel like now I've worked through and I have a good approach. And if I can produce, you know, a few hundred trees each time uh, we get a good mast year, then that's really enough if we just keep at it into the future and keep you know, adding some trees here and there as we. I need more people, Wally. I need I need a staff of uh, five people and a and a large facility and uh, uh, you know resources. Okay, we'll have to build a greenhouse here. <laughs> Yeah, hey, uh, build one. I'll use it. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. So, so Bob, um, in terms of what niches currently owns, how much is the 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 acid residuum soils that that would be good sites? Um, do you have that number, a rough number? Um, I do have that number somewhere. Uh, I I can't off the top of my head remember, and it's not written down right by me here either. But um, reality is that we have a lot of locations to do this work in. Um, and the reality also is that a lot of the locations are doing fine, you know, Crows Grove. Um, I have a feeling that the Whistler Hare Woods population will regenerate with some extra work there doing some uh, thinning and fire. Uh, and so we have several places where we could do this stuff um, outside of where the existing populations are. And I, I want to say it's something around uh, eight or 10% uh, of, of our properties where um, we have this residuum soil, you know, eight, eight to ten percent of the actual ground area is appropriate. Okay. <laughs> happy. Who's dog? I don't know. What, I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> I look like that's Pauline's dog. I muted her. <laughs> Great. Um, well, cool. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, uh, if there's any other follow-up questions, otherwise, we'll get it wrapped up here. Um, and uh, uh, when you get out and visit any of the Crows Grove or Whistler Hare Woods or, or uh, um, the other properties, Wire Leopold and stuff, where we have some of the remnant trees, you know, gives you some greater, hopefully some greater appreciation for what they are and kind of where they fit into the bigger picture of where we're headed with the lands. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks again, Gus and Bob. Hey, thanks. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you very much.